Hello there, you're watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages as they arrive. And it's time to see what's making the headlines with the Financial Times' as chief political correspondent, Jim Pickard, and the journalist and broadcaster, Leslie Riddick. They're going to be with us from now until just before midnight. Thank you both very much for joining us. Uh, so let's see what's on the front of some of those papers. And The Guardian writes that the architects of the Paris Agreement say that the COP climate targets are too weak. The Metro reports on what it calls a 999 cause crisis, with ambulances in England taking on average three times longer than their target to reach patients. While the Northern Echo says tens of thousands of patients in its region alone are waiting to be seen for non-COVID problems. The Eye hears that the Tory MP Natalie Elphick, who told Marcus Rashford to focus on his day job when he was campaigning for free school meals, has herself been holding down a second job, which pays £36,000 a year. The Times leads with this story about MPs writing that 14 of them are using the parliamentary expenses scheme to rent out their homes whilst they stay in London. The Telegraph says the US is concerned Russia may attempt to invade Ukraine in a repeat of its annexation of Crimea in 2014. According to the Financial Times, the passage of China's first historical resolution in 40 years, which will likely see President Xi Jinping stay in power for at least seven more years, is a move which is drawing comparisons to Chairman Mao. Well, Jim Pickard and Leslie Riddock both join us tonight. Uh, up in Scotland, you're both up there covering COP26, so we thank you for, for not being out on the lash on the last night of the conference uh, and instead staying inside to talk to us. Um, let's start with, with the COP developments, though. Um, oh, you know, The Guardian says that the, tar the, the targets are too weak to avoid disaster. Are we going to be able to keep it at 1.5%, which was the, the, the stated aim of this? Leslie, what, what is your feeling after covering this for two weeks? Do you feel that, that perhaps hopes were too high at the moment? It's so hard to say something about this now because there, there's so, I mean, there's one quote somebody's come up with today, which is that there's a draining complexity to this meeting like no other. By gum, is that true? Um, there's also now uh, almost breakouts. There's so many subgroups that have been um, pushing their agendas. We know about the America-China deal. Today, there was uh, BOGA, which is Denmark and Costa Rica. Those are the kind of front runners, the guys who want to run faster. So it feels like the, the idea of having one push to get 1.5 absolutely protected seems to have sort of gone. And uh, the, this, this array of sub uh, agreements seems to be what people are hoping they might manage to push for. And all the while, the difficulty is that the developing world is not going to abide by um, restrictions on its emissions as its economy tries to grow if there isn't going to be the money on the table from the developed world, which it's actually welched on as a deal for practically 10 years. Mm. Jim, I mean, you know, some of the countries don't even want references to fossil fuels to be inside these documents. It, it, it does seem that the, the ability to get all of these people to even agree on the wording for anything that can possibly be announced tomorrow seems possibly a little optimistic. Yeah, I mean, what the experts here talk about is they talk about a less common denominator deal whereby you get the 200 countries in the room, you finally reach a point where you can all agree. But for that to happen, the language has to be incredibly vague. And people were surprised that, yes, the original draft that came out yesterday did have a reference to trying to eliminate fossil fuels eventually. No one believes that will make it to the final communique as that comes out at the weekend at some indeterminate point. And the story in The Guardian talking about how an old track to hit 1.5 is you know, they've interviewed two of the architects of the Paris Agreement from six years ago, but nothing that either of these gentlemen is saying is going to come as a surprise to anybody uh, here at COP26. Boris Johnson, obviously the host of COP26, has talked about coal, cash, cars, trees, which were kind of four sub sub agreements, almost not anything to do with COP26 itself. They were sort of separate deals. The overarching aim of the agreement, however, was keep 1.5 alive, which is to keep emissions on that track. And no one here thinks that's possible. And we as a, a planet are currently on track for something more like 2.4 degrees of heating. And that may sound like quite a narrow difference. We are told by climate experts that there is a world of difference between those two, and we are definitely on the wrong track. 
Leslie, do you think there's any chance that we might see the Prime Minister coming back up? Um, I don't know. Uh, from, from having been there, what I heard from quite a number of the, uh, the observers who were actually screened out mostly of the plenary sessions and unable to get in, as they were to previous COP sessions, um, what they felt was that um, the leaders had all come at the beginning primarily to avoid being there, holding the baby, as it were, right at this moment when not very much is achieved, or at least 1.5 is not safeguarded. Um, so the thinking is that probably leaders are not going to want to be there at the end. That happened in Copenhagen, where they all turned up at the end, and actually there really wasn't the result that they'd hoped for. I don't know if Boris Johnson arriving, boosting this boosterism idea, I don't know that this is really where we're stuck with with uh, the, the the detail now. So I'd be astonished myself if Boris Johnson came back. But you know, um, he's he's seemingly quite fond of taking the train these days. <laughs> uh, right. Well, the, the other big story of, of the week, aside from from COP, has of course been Slee's MPs' second jobs. What MPs should or shouldn't be doing? Um, Jim, you've done you've done a piece which is on the front of the FT, um, and perhaps it was inevitable. A, a, a quite a thorough examination of Boris Johnson's outside earnings. What have you revealed? So, I mean, this this whole scandal has taken quite a strange twist, which was. The original story, which was so damaging, was this attempt by the Prime Minister Boris Johnson to whip his own Tory MPs into backing an attempt to overturn the entire standard system, basically to save the neck of Owen Paterson, this disgraced former cabinet minister. Boris Johnson ended up resigning. Despite, uh, Boris Johnson ended up U-turning, which led to Owen Paterson resigning. But the story is kind of like when you start a fire in a, in a prairie, the fire is, is now spreading and, and the media are turning there or our attention to other MPs with second jobs. And there's quite a lot of unsavory stuff coming out there. You all know about Jeffrey Cox, the barrister who's been advising uh, a tax haven in the Caribbean 4,000 miles away when he was supposedly meant to be representing his constituents in Parliament. Now, Boris Johnson popped up yesterday and basically took the moral high ground and said to his MPs, your primary duty should be to your constituents. I'd expect you to be focusing most of your attention on your day job. But the only problem with this, as our FT research on the front page says in tomorrow's paper, he himself has taken £4.3 million in outside earnings since only 2008. And the only reason we can't calculate a higher figure is that for the seven years before that, when he was an MP, there weren't proper records kept by the Commons Register of Interest. So somewhere way north of £4 million he's taken on board. To be fair to the Prime Minister, this wasn't through consultancy or lobbying or some of the things that have been particularly controversial, particularly in the Owen Patterson case. But even so, it makes it harder for him to preside over the clear-up, which he is claiming that he now wants to do. I mean, Jim, there's no suggestion that he's, he, that he's done this work since becoming Prime Minister, is there? No, so the money, the 4.3 million basically divides into 2.7 million that he did when he was the mayor of London. And most of that was from a column that he did in the Daily Telegraph newspaper for £250,000 a year, which he at the time described as chicken feed. Um, subsequently, as he came back to the House of Commons in 2015, he did loads of speeches, he's been writing books, uh, newspaper columns where he's picked up another £1.6 million. And of course, when he was Foreign Secretary, he couldn't do this kind of thing. When he was Prime Minister, he couldn't do this kind of thing. Although, remember, there was this rumour that he's still trying to write a book about William Shakespeare, and he's not denied that he may be doing a bit of work there on the side while Prime Minister. And also, we make the point that he is talking about MP he should focus on a single job. But he himself was editor of The Spectator magazine in the early 2000s for four years while being an MP, and he has also double-hatted the job of Mayor of London with being an MP. So it's really a story about Boris Johnson trying to sort of set a good example, but his own track record is, is not necessarily quite as... Uh, yeah, easy to defend as one might. Uh, and, Le and Leslie, broadening it out now, if we look at the Times, their front page story is is an, another uh, way that MPs are making money aside from the day job, and this is a rent expenses loophole where where those based in London are are renting out properties they already own, but rent to other people, and then being paid to live somewhere else. Just explain it to yes. us. Yes. Well, um, uh, Jeffrey Cox, who seems to be the gift that just keeps giving, actually, um, seems to be one of these uh, who has a flat 
Uh, it originally seems to have been paid by the taxpayer. Um, he, however, has another flat, which is the one that he now claims money on. And the, the, I think at one stage, both of them have been rented out as he trots the world um, working for companies located in extremely exotic locations. I mean, interestingly, he was actually in Mauritius when he in, uh, launched his um, his his, his uh, defence of himself on his website um, with yet another um, legal firm that he he seems to be a director of. But I think um, absolutely, it's as Jim says, it is like this prairie fire. I, I wonder, um, despite the painstaking work that Jim's undertaken on Boris Johnson, if this will really damage him particularly because. As everybody says, um, to be honest, uh, double standards and getting away with it seems to be priced into the Boris offer. It's the fact that lesser uh, mortals who perhaps have less of what seems to be the kind of, well, from north of the border, it's hard to understand, but charm or whatever it is that Boris Johnson manages to exert to get away with things, um, that doesn't cover the, this, the, the re realms of people now that are being looked at and are finding all sorts of bits of hypocrisy. And I'm old enough, Jim, I don't think maybe, to remember all of this quite vividly from the 1990s. This is exactly how it started last time round. It started and it ended up with duck houses, didn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah, it is just an ongoing story. And um, staying with MPs who are possibly saying one thing and doing another, um, Jim, the Eyes front page story, its headline, Priceless, the MP who told Rashford to focus on the day job has a second job. You couldn't make it up, could you? It's, it's such a good headline. There's almost nothing left to say on, 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 on top of that. I don't think you even need to know what the job is, which is... I think it's chairing some kind of house building industry group, but it's just it's just the most wonderful headline. Going back to the Times front page a second ago, I think the point of that story was that not only Jeffrey Cox has been proved that he's been uh, taking expenses for a flat in London while renting out the property that he owns in London. I think the Times has identified a dozen other MPs doing the same thing, and they include grandees such as Liam Fox, uh, a Tory MP called Philip Davis. And most ironic of all in there is a guy called John Whittingdale, who you'll remember is a former culture minister who was going to be lined up as the chair of this new standards body, which Boris Johnson was trying to replace the existing perfectly good standards body with a week ago. It was John Whittingdale. We, you broke up a little bit there. But thank you very much, both of you. Leslie, let's start with you for this section. The Daily Telegraph and, and all of the papers, in fact, in this section that we're looking at are looking at the situation in Belarus uh, and what is happening out there uh, with Russia. It's, we've seen the airplanes coming across Belarus. Our correspondent there reported on that yesterday. But, but now the Telegraph suggesting that this may also be a way of Russia bringing in Ukraine into this. Yes, I mean, it's, it seems like a really alarming uh, sort of escalation that's happening here. As uh, you piece together did the different stories that are uh, reporting on this, you see these these movements, these mass movements of troops now to that, that border, something like 90,000 troops, apparently Russian troops. That's what the Ukrainians are reporting. Uh, they've sent about 8,500 troops to meet them. So clearly that's never going to hold. But um, it's, it's also uh, interesting to see places like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, all reporting the same worries about build-ups. There's reports that there's been meetings between President Biden and Ursula von der Leyen. Whilst COP's been going on, they've been meeting actually in the White House uh, in Washington to, to try to discuss what to do next. So there, are, all the building blocks are, are beginning to be there with, of course, the added possible mm. threat from Belarus about gas supplies. And, and Jim, The Guardian um, picks up on that very point, that, that this is the next step, isn't it, that, that Belarus threatening to cut off the gas. Are they behaving slightly childishly? And this, this is one of these situations where, you know, obviously the Russians annexed Crimea seven years ago and, and it was made headlines for a few months and then it kind of disappears off the radar and the British public forget about it. But this is, this is a situation which has been grinding on ever since and there's effectively been a cold war, or not, not, not a hot war, really, between uh, Russian pro-Russian dissidents in eastern Ukraine and Kiev. You know, 14,000 people have lost their lives in that. You wouldn't know about that. You wouldn't believe that's happening right on the edge of Europe. Um, and Russia's intentions towards Ukraine are obviously hostile. The calculation Putin may eventually make, or is probably making regularly, is whether or not this time around 
NATO will step in. We shall and see. Help. Um, Jim, Jim and Leslie, I'm sorry to cut you off, but we are out of time for this half an hour.